thank you for joining us today. Um, and also, happy Women's Month to everyone. I know that's kind of a strange thing to say. A lot of people have been having discussions about what the real meaning of Women's Day is. And in many respects, it's, it seems quite condescending to just say happy Women's Day because there's actually a lot underneath that to talk about in terms of gender-based violence, um, equal payment, fairness in the workplace. So I hope you're happy to know that this conversation is not just a kind of a tick box for Women's Month, but it's going to be a deep engaging cross panel discussion where we've got a number of people from the legal industry who are going to be asked questions from a number of female students in um, South African universities. My name is Adama Yusa and I'm going to be chairing this panel discussion. I work at WITS University as the Strategic Partnerships Manager in the WITS School of Law. I also run a website called Black Coconut where um, we discuss the intersection of black womanhood, sexuality, feminism, and race. So I'm just gonna start off by int introducing our panel members who are in the legal industry. We've got Lerato Tahani who is at Bowman's and she is a partner in mergers and acquisitions. We've got Tiani Majoko who is a student at Cornell Law School and she's joining us from the US where it's 5 a.m. So thank you very much for joining us at that time. And she's a legal consultant with logistics. We've got Keshni Naika, who's also a partner at Bowman's. Um, she's in the employment and benefits practice. We've got Amanda Lamond, who's a legal transformation consultant at the Center for Integrative Law. And our last uh, speaker from industry is Umaima Salasa Khan, who is also a partner at Bowman's in the commercial litigation practice. Our student representatives come, across, um, come from universities across South Africa. We've got Laurie Oliver from um, Stellenbosch University. She's from the Judicial Society at Stellenbosch and she's head of student affairs. We've got Charlize Finch from the University of Cape Town, who is the Secretary General of the Black, Laws Association, Black Lawyers Association. Kashmita Gaiden from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, who's a tutor and completing her master's degree in business law. We've got Raisha Ramakalawana, sorry, apologies, who is from Pretoria University Law House and she's social co-head. We've got Abigail Sokoni, who is from the University of Western Cape, and she is the General Secretary, General Secretary of the Law Students Council. And lastly, from the institution I work at, we have Ola Natandu Numalo, who is the Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General of the Law Students Council. So with that introduction, I'm gonna hand over to our first student with a question. I've got Charlize from UCT who's going to ask a question to a member of the panel. Charlize, can we get your question, please? Good morning. My first question is to Lerato from Bauman's. It pertains to the workspace at Bauman's. And the question is, does a good work environment exist where women's careers can progress at the same speed of men's careers in light of things such as maternity leave, pregnancy, and having a good family life? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question, Charlize. It's um, a really insightful one and a really important one in this day and age. Um, the short answer from my perspective is yes, it's possible. Um, I can't speak to other law firms. I certainly can't speak to other workplaces and other companies, but I will share with you anecdotally a personal experience of mine um, to demonstrate um, from experience that it is possible. Um, and also to give everyone um, who's in, in this webinar um, a picture of what it looks like when it's done right. Um, I'm a partner at Bowman's and I'm in the M&A practice group. And if anyone knows anything about mergers and acquisitions, um, you will have heard about the long hours and the grueling um, demands um, that my line of work has. So you can imagine when my husband and I decided to start a family, how anxious I was um, about what impact this may have on my trajectory and my future at the firm. Um, I reached out to a number of senior partners to let them know how nervous I was about it. And the support that I got was overwhelming. Um, it genuinely was heartwarming to see um, people not only in their words offer me support, 
but I actually got an infrastructure built around me to help me support to help me feel supported in my preparation for maternity leave and to assist me when I come back. And just to give everybody on this webinar a feel for what the support looks like. Um, in the first instance, I was given the option, the option to take on more work while I was pregnant or to take on less work. And I think this option is very important because not all women who are pregnant want to slow down. Um, I was a new partner and I wanted to ramp up earlier on in my pregnancy and then slow down later on in my pregnancy. And with the support that I had at the office, we could structure the nine months before my baby arrived in a way that suited me. Um, and this was actually done and supported. Um, secondly, I was paired up with a maternity coach at the expense of my law firm. Um, and this maternity coach walked the journey with me from beginning. So as I prepared for maternity leave, she helped me navigate the period towards going on maternity leave in a way that would be beneficial for my career growth. And through mentorship sessions and engagements with the firm, she guided me through the process and guided the various partners that I work with um, and prepared them for my not being around for a couple of months. While I was on maternity leave, we had a couple of coaching sessions and she was there for me when I felt anxious about coming back to work or whether I'd be able to find my feet again and grow my practice once again, she held my hand through the journey, which was absolutely beneficial. And most importantly, now that I'm back at work with a brand new little Baba, she's holding my hand still and she's supporting me while I find my feet and transition back into my world of work. Um, fantastically, my firm made it possible for me to take six months maternity leave and completely plug out of work in order to build a fantastic foundational relationship with my little baby. Um, and this did not come at the expense of my work or my clients, because when I came back from maternity leave, I was supported to integrate back into my practice, to take back all of my matters and to reignite all of my client relationships. Um, in the first month after my maternity leave, I was put on what we call a measured ramp up where my billables were reduced and I was given the option to very slowly get back into the world of work. And again, this was fantastically beneficial for me because it gave me the opportunity to slowly ramp up work while I transition and get my baby used to not having 24-7 contact time with me. Um, and most importantly, the partners at the firm rallied around me. People checked up on me very often. People have given me an opportunity to collaborate with them in the work that I do. Partners that I didn't before have a relationship with check up on me and make sure I'm doing well. I'm on the radar of senior management at the firm that cares about how my transition is going. And that's been fully supported. And honestly, I don't know too many people who've had an experience like this. I almost feel like my trajectory is better now since having a baby than it was before because people are putting in an effort to help support me. And I think that's what it looks like when it's done right. Um, and other young lawyers, other young female lawyers operating around me have in a way, um, an example of the kind of support that lies ahead. So I hope that people aren't scared looking at, you know, partners or senior lawyers who start a family and who in a way put their careers on hold a little bit to prioritize family over work because when you come back, there is the option to get right back to where you were before um, with the support that you need. Um, and, you know, as I wrap up, I also want to make the point that it's not just in the space of starting a family that um, women need support. There are women who have no ambition of having a family, but who have outside interests. Um, I have colleagues who travel around the world and run marathons. I have colleagues who have um, hobbies which require a lot of time and commitment from them. And the firm is just as supporting in relation to those events. Um, two years ago, my husband had to go work in Germany for a year. Um, and the firm supported me when I said, 
I don't want to be in a long distance marriage. I want to travel with him for a year, but I'd still like to continue working. And they arranged for me to go into a convent and work at a prestigious law firm, Freshfields, in the Munich office doing what I do while keeping my home intact. So there are various points and stages in one's career where a good work environment has to accommodate and build in some measure of flexibility. And um, the example and the question that was raised centers around pregnancy, but there are other events that need to be supported. And um, I'm really proud to work at a firm that gets that and supports women. I hope that in a long way answers your question. Thanks, Lerata. I've got a follow up question for you. How was your maternity leave itself? Were you able to relax into that time with your baby? Did you have any anxiety about returning to the office? Um, my maternity leave was fantastic, Adanma. I completely plugged out. So I would check my emails maybe every two days. And literally, it was a matter of check file, check file, check delete everything was taken care of. Um, the firm built an infrastructure of people around me who took on all of my matters and just ran with it. Um, every now and then people would ask me a question because it's, it's something that's sort of in my head or institutionalized or sitting with me and they can find the answer somewhere else. But I was able to completely plug out and in a way be a fly on the wall watching all of my matters successfully run. Um, was I anxious about coming back? Absolutely. Six months is a long time to be out of the game. And I wondered whether I'd be able to come back and perform at the same level that I did before. And I know that a lot of working moms have these fears. And that's where the benefit of the coach comes in. I was able to WhatsApp her and say, listen, I need a session. I've got this new worry today. Um, and she was a great support. She was there for me. She answered all the questions I had. Um, in some respects, I needed her to escalate some of the concerns I had to the other sort of partners that in my team um, and for her to help me set up a new way of working when I come back from maternity that everybody understood and accommodated and she did that. So the anxieties were taken seriously, they were actioned um, and I think it's all of that sort of preemptory work that made it possible for me to come back and really find my feet in a way that balances really beautifully the work that I love and also the family that I love. Thanks, Lerato. Um, Amanda, do you want to add something to that? We've got about three minutes before the next question. So, Lerato, I want to say it was very heartening to hear of your experience, and I'm delighted that Bowman's went all out for you in this way. It really is, um, it, it, that's a triumph. I, I have to say, though, that I, I think your experience, and I think you sort of indicated that may be unusual, um, and that it's not the experience of a lot of women in law. So it's wonderful that Bowman's is investing in this way, particularly in the maternity coaching, which you saw, you know, firsthand the enormous value of. Um, from, from my experience running Willela and having endless conversations with women, I, I definitely think things haven't changed fast enough. And the predominant reason being that I think in law, you're measured by so often still the quantity of work that you can put out rather than the quality of your work. And the reality is that when you choose to combine your career and family, you will have less hours. So the quality of your work doesn't go down, but if you're going to be measured on quantity, you have less hours. Um, and so I just spoke to, you know, over the years, so many women were just in such great pain, wondering how to, how to juggle it. And in the end, a lot of them in law firms chose to take up other positions, not like partners. So they would do um, like be the research head or a department, you know, head in a way where you're not actually are billing by the hour. So I think that we've still got quite a long way to go. Um, just in terms of yeah, the enormous personal suffering that I saw of women working all hours. And then the belief by women, often the older women, so women in their 50s, 60s, who, who said things to me like, you can be a good mother or a good lawyer, you can't be both. And I you know, was shocked to hear people saying things like that. But that belief is still unfortunately out there. And so I think we've still got a long way and we need to share more openly. Um, so your story, you know, if, if there was a support group for women in law, which is what I was trying to do, um, so that we could share more about, about the resources that are available and just help that change to go faster. And if law firms knew they were only going to attract candidates based on, you know, what they provided for women who did want to have a family, I think that that would help in terms of making the marketplace more competitive with people choosing firms based on 
Johnny. I like how you treat your women. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that point is really important, and um, one of our attend one of the attendees also at Star Hislop raised something similar. Kind of how often does this happen? How universal is the experience that Lorato had? So thanks for that. Okay, our next question comes from Laurie at Stellenbosch. Laurie, can we get your question, please? Hi there. Um, so our question is for Amanda, um, and it's specifically with regards to whether male co-workers or colleagues are supportive of women being labeled as a feminist, or is it sort of perceived as a threat in the workplace? And then additionally, are there male co-workers who are open to identifying themselves as a feminist, specifically when there's such a misconception as to what a feminist is? So I think where you ended is, is the starting point is that there is such a misperception around what the word feminist means. And I think it's really sad that the term is so highly controversial because it actually means that a vocabulary doesn't even exist for us to talk about women being equal citizens. You know, we, if the word is so controversial, then it, it, it puts us at a very low starting point. There have been so many studies done on the term feminism and what it means, and I'm not an academic, so I don't have credentials in that area. But I think that even most of our listeners will agree that the word feminism on the one hand for people has its meaning of like empowerment and purpose and unity and being equal. But to others, there is still this very strong notion that it's a radical idea associated with men bashing, men hating, and sort of embracing underarm hair. And that's really unfortunate. Um, there is a professor of women, gender and sexuality studies, and I liked what she said about feminism because she says it's a two part project. On the one hand, it's about addressing social injustices based on race, class, gender, and sexuality, which is the, that intersectionality, so the myriad aspects of identity. And then the second part is about celebrating women and actually seeing their achievements and seeing their name in the history books. So if we look at the workplace today, and I don't know if we're talking specifically about you know, the legal workplace, but I, I presume we are, I think that male co-workers don't really embrace the term feminism and that it's going to be very rare that a man would um, say that I'm a feminist. Um, and I know it sounds terrible to say so, but probably only if you kind of have done some gender studies or if a man thinks that it's going to make him look good, um, that there is something to be won by, by identifying as a feminist. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that there is, a, there is much claiming of that term feminism by men. Although, and men may say, oh, I support feminism. But as one of my students said to me, then they see you kicking ass and their feminism goes out of the window. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's very true. And then there are other men who would say, well, I'm not a feminist because of the issues with the term, but I do respect women's rights. And so there's, again, it keeps bringing up this whole thing around, well, what do we mean by, by feminism? And then I think in South Africa, we still have a big challenge around men wanting to be seen as, as powerful. Um, and so there's this thing of like people, when women identify as feminists or the feminist agenda comes up, but even you know, around gender in meetings, you get the eye rolling when, when people mention the word and either it's sort of open um, or it's behind people's backs. Um, and so I think that there are men who would see identifying themselves as a feminist as weak. And you know, this question, it, it made me reflect that my husband is my biggest champion and he had a very strong mother, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to be married to me. And I do regard him as a feminist in so many of his views, but I don't think that he would call himself a feminist. And so it's a discussion I'm going to have with him tonight around, you know, this term and how comfortable he feels. Um, and I think we, it's something we have to just keep debating. Um, it is, it, it's far from over, but I think that for men, it is a struggle to appropriate that word. And I understand that being so, if it's such a problem for women to own that term, there's so many women who don't say that they are feminists because they don't um, 
you know, the, the, the term for them is still also associated with the, with the underarm hair and the, the man hating. Um, and so if women aren't comfortable claiming to be feminists, how can we expect men to? So I'm not sure if that means we, we need to move the debate to a different, you know, terminology past that word. I'm not sure. I'd welcome any other views because I think we have to talk about this. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and just on that question, how comfortable do you think female lawyers are embracing being an, a feminist or saying I am a feminist in the legal workplace? Is it something that you've come across more? Is it something that people shy away from? Is there space even to, to, to say you are a feminist? I think in the legal sphere, yes, because women tend to have done a bit of research and understand what the word means. But in terms of what that means and how it plays out, I've had too many women say to me, powerful women, that in the end, they decided that it was detrimental to their career to advocate the cause of women within their firms. And so having tried to you know, develop initiatives, take up the cause in the end, they decided they would, you know, mentor women individually and have that one-on-one, -on -one, but that they weren't going out to bat for women in the firm as a whole because of the effect it had on their career. And that's really sad. That is really sad. Um, do you think the legal industry may be a little bit worse? I don't want to say worse. Does it, does it differ from other industries, maybe media? Perhaps you could be more out, out as um, a feminist in other industries or what do you think? I think so. Um, you know, one of the things I've always said is that the legal profession was designed by men for men. And that's not a criticism, that's just a reality. Uh, and we also know that change happens much more slowly in law. Um, you know, again, I, in, in some of the presentations, I used to put up the slides of, of barristers in England with the horsehair wigs. You know, there's an extraordinary amount of, we are very backward looking in many ways. Tradition is good, but at what cost? And so if you look at developments in business and where businesses are being run and being values-based and whatever, law firms tend to be about 20 years behind the curve. Um, and that's, that's a fact. There are a lot of people writing about that, that law is slow to change because of it being based on precedent and tradition. And so I think that it's natural that in regard to how women are treated, that there's also a bit of a lag and that other industries are definitely progressing faster than us. Thanks a lot, Amanda. Okay, so we're going to go on to our next question, which comes from Abigail at UWC. Go ahead, Abigail. Hi. Um... My question is to Tiani. Um, it's regarding the corporate um, corporate world. What can us the students do um, to prepare us for the corporate world? And what skills should we develop to adapt to the corporate world? Hi, uh, Amanda. Hi, Abigail and everybody. Good morning. Um, so I'll answer this kind of with the view of my own journey um, as an attorney. So I started out um, at one of the big firms uh, in Joburg. I rarely say their name because they don't pay me to advertise for them. Uh, so I won't mention which firm it is, but I started out there like as, a, as an as associate, uh, did my articles and became an associate in the mining department there. And then when I was there, I was just like, I'm really enjoying the work that I do, but the culture is killing me. And I don't think it's anything unique to that specific firm. It's just the nature of the legal industry. So when I hear of like people like Lerato that absolutely are thriving and love it, I'm actually like a little bit jealous that um, I didn't have the opportunity to fall in love with the law firm industry, like in that way, and kind of had to like fight and like, um, forge a whole other path uh, in, you know, in, in my own career. But I would say, you know, then coming out of that, then went to work for a really small, like startup that was doing work in oil and gas and mining across the African continent, which worked well and also worked terribly uh, for a number of reasons. But then coming out of that, then started my own legal consulting firm um, in 2014 called Logistics Legal Consultants with one of my um, university friends. So one of the first things I'd say is like, identify people in your class that are, um, you know, that are just like smart, committed, driven, and are ready to do the work. 
And you can see those qualities, even right now as students, like who's the person that always has all the notes versus the person who's like, guys, <laughs> did anyone do a question number? Does anyone have the answers for me? So, you know, be able to identify those, those, those uh, type of people. And then also in corporate law, uh, which is, you know, what we can, what, what we primarily do at logistics is more commercial law with aspects of corporate law, of course, and then uh, quite a lot of corporate governance as well in our practice. And it's really about working with, com with clients in, in the business world. They're super solution orientated, not saying that in other industries they aren't, but uh, they want to know, can I do this? Um, you know, is this good? What is this going to cost me? Uh, they want to get an answer because for them, they're running a business and you are a resource that they rely on to get their work done for them to get the output that they're looking for. So it's about being solutions orientated and getting into that mindset now and being um, really like embracing critical thinking, like being able to distill something as quickly as possible. So it's getting yourself into that type of skill. I would say from just like a practical standpoint, it's about reading business news um, and getting acquainted with the Companies Act and seeing how it affects business and how it plays out in the real world. Because I mean, there's kind of the stuff that you do when you're in school and you learn about. But I mean, when I was in university, for example, I didn't know how to register a company uh, at the CIPC. I had no clue how to do that. And if you're advising a, a corporate, like that is one of the things that you're going to have to either be in a position to do yourself or like figure out, you know, who to find to do, you know, to do that for you. So it's learning about, you know, um, as, as practically as possible. And now that I'm in uh, the US and I've just graduated from my master's at Cornell um, and having, you know, been taught by some of the best lawyers in New York and Silicon Valley and so forth, you then get to, again, see how important it is. For example, like one of the people that taught us was Facebook's first lawyer. And he was talking about when he met Mark Zuckerberg, he was like 19 or, or something like that. And, you know, how do you like begin to identify um, and that relationship building aspect then becomes super important because he was able to, you know, build that relationship and see something, identify a talent that he had and that skill that he had and the idea and the vision and work with him like from register, from incorporating their company all the way to, I think at some point he, he works with companies from a cert, he doesn't go like beyond like, I think like a series A. But also when you are um, in South Africa, I, there's quite a bit of activity that's um, gonna be coming up with respect to, you know, the startup industry and people, you know, embracing entrepreneurship so it's getting yourself acquainted with the legal aspects around that and the um, regulatory, you know, concepts that are going to be, that might be developed. I've been hearing people talking about a startup act in South Africa, which I do not support. I think that is a horrible idea. There's already so much legislation around businesses at the moment and it's like use that properly. But anyway, um, so if that does happen, you want to be, ready you know to to work with companies that are coming up so beginning to learn about startups um and not small businesses but like startups like in the true sense of like an actual startup that is venture backed or venture backable and beginning to get familiar with some of those um how they work so looking at countries not even in the u.s but like in other parts of africa like nigeria has like a really really good um startup culture as well as Kenya, uh, all of those tech hubs. So it's beginning to like understand the relationship between, you know, technology, intellectual property, commercial arrangements, and all of that and putting it all together. And right now, while you're still a student, go as wide as you can, because when you get into a law firm, you might, it does get a little bit siloed from place to place, you know, from different practice areas where you might only focus on like one aspect. So this is your opportunity to go as wide as you can so that you can make out a really good case about which um, practice group you want to be put into when you actually start. So the, the more you can do now on your own, so it's like subscribing to LexisNexis, uh, Westlaw, you know, um, Thomson Reuters. And I know those alerts are, 
annoying every day, but, um, you know, just find like one or two things that are going to be of interest to you. Um, yeah. So those are, that would kind of be like my advice in terms of how to get into uh, and start, you know, getting ready to approach uh, corporate law. Thanks, Tiani. Um, Narata, did you want to add something to, to um, Abigail's question? Um, yes, I did. Thank you very much, Tiani. Um, I was also taking notes as you were talking. Those were really valuable insights. Um, I just wanted to add two additional items to the list of things that people can do in preparation for corporate um, law. The first one is to discover meaningfully um, what energizes you and what makes you happy. Um, I think corporate law and client services as a whole is quite demanding mentally, physically, and just holistically. And if you don't know what fills your cup and energizes you and refuels you, you'll find that you're constantly going to give to your peers and your bosses and your clients and to whichever firm you work in or whichever company you work in. Um, and not a lot of people will add to your cup. You have to do that. Um, and if you don't spend enough time refueling yourself and feeding yourself and motivating yourself and keeping yourself happy and balanced, um, you do run the risk of kind of burning out, um, getting over it and leaving. So discover what makes you happy and whole now and get into the culture of doing a lot of that every day. So when you start working, it's a part of your DNA and you don't run the risk of everybody taking from you um, and you being left empty. The second thing I would suggest is discover and learn now how you learn. Um, we don't all learn the same way. And I think universities kind of treat us all like we're the same people. Like you can sit in a lecture room, someone says stuff to you, then you read a textbook and then miraculously you know everything. But that's not how everybody learns and engages with new content. We're all very different and we all learn very differently. differently. Discover how you learn from a unique perspective and bring that into the workspace. I'm sorry to burst bubbles, but most of what you're learning now at university, you're not really going to use every day. Most of what I do on a daily basis, I've learned on the job. Um, but you can't learn and absorb all of that and sort of make it a part of your arsenal if you don't know how you learn. So discover that, engage with that, and then be bold enough to get to a workspace and say, hey, partner so-and-so, I know I'm your CA assigned to you. This is how I best learn. So if you shout at me, I'm not going to learn. If you send me long emails, you know, I, I don't learn that way. I learn through dialogue and debate and engagement. So the more of this we do, the better I will learn. So can we add that into our repertoire and in, in how we engage with each other? And that, I think, will set you apart, in addition to the invaluable um, items that Tiana shared with us. Thanks, Lorato, for adding that. Um, thanks, Tiani and Abigail, for the question. Um, before I move on to the next question, um, I see there's a couple of questions coming in on the Zoom chat. If we've got time at the end of the discussion, we're going to add these, um, I'll put these questions to the panel as well to answer. If not, what we'll do, I'll ask Kashir if maybe we can look at them via email. So that said, on to the next question, I've got Kashmita from UKZN. Kashmita, have you got a question for the panel? Please go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my question is to Umema from Bowman's. As a young female attorney, I've noticed that I struggle to get my point across in an argument without becoming emotional. Therefore, my question is, how do you remain objective and eliminate emotion when dealing with the case? Hi, Kashmita. Thank you for your, um, for your question. Uh, before I go into answering it, I thought that it would be worthwhile just to highlight that the legal profession has changed not fast enough um, over the past few decades, but there has been a great degree of change. Um, and what I've seen is that it's no longer enough to simply be technically excellent in your field of specialization. That's not all that law firms are looking for. Um, in lawyers. There's a lot more that goes with it now. Um, there's a concept of almost like a new generation lawyer 
uh, where you'll find that lawyers are technically excellent, but they're also very aware and in touch with their emotional intelligence. Um, and I think that if you look, if you look at the profession today, um, one of the most substantial changes that we've seen is more women entering the law firm and occupying top positions. Um, and these women obviously have the ability to drive and implement significant change. And with more women entering, what we've also seen is an exit in older generation partners um, where the focus was very much on technical um, excellence and technical ability and not so much on the emotional well-being of, of lawyers. Um, and I think that this recognition has really taken off now. And law firms are, well, Bowman's at least, is putting a lot of emphasis on um, equipping lawyers with the skills that they need to build on and be aware of the emotional intelligence and the way that that impacts on their ability to lead and manage people and also the ability to attract and retain key clients. Um, because I think what's, what's interesting is that you mentioned eliminating emotions in your question um, in order to be objective. And what I'd really like to impart to you is emotions aren't necessarily a bad thing and you should rather view it as a strength which you can leverage when you're actually building your career. Um, because I find that emotionally intelligent lawyers, you actually communicate better. Um, because ultimately, we are all human beings. Even, I mean, colleagues, clients, we're all human beings. And being technically excellent is not the way to connect with your clients and have a meaningful relationship and become a trusted advisor. That, for me, comes down to the human connection. Because if we look across law firms, there's lots of technically excellent lawyers. Um, but what is going to set you apart is your personal brand. And I'm a firm believer that you can, you can use your consciousness of your emotional intelligence to actually leverage that and build your brand and set you apart. Um, so there was just two things that I wanted to briefly mention. How your emotions can actually help you in two very important ways um, in building a practice. Firstly, as I said, we're all human beings and it's the human connection um, which really resonates with people. The second thing is a big part of your job as a lawyer is managing um, and developing people, particularly as you progress in your career. You'll have to manage junior team members and as the team leader, you really set the tone for your team. And as lawyers coming into the firm are getting younger and younger, and people want more and more, they want work-life balance, they want flexibility, um, as they should. And I think that as a leader, it's very important to be conscious of your emotions um, and able to lead effectively. Because a happy team and a team that feels safe and emotionally supported is automatically product they're productive and they're profitable because they don't get quizzed, they get supported. Um, it's a safe space for them to speak up to. And I think that if you completely eliminate your emotions, you're not going to be in touch with that. So you'll never be able to form that meaningful, that meaningful connections that we need. Um, and then another thing that I just wanted to raise is that you do not need to completely eliminate your, your emotions in order to remain objective when you are dealing with, with your matters. Um, what you do need to learn is how to manage your emotions, particularly in charged situations, um, so that it doesn't end up clouding your objectivity. So never eliminate, but know how to manage it. Um, and this is something that I find it develops over time, and it also comes with experience. Um, but that being said, it is some, something that I do struggle with, particularly being in disputes where the engagements that you have, it is largely adversarial. Um, it's very argumentative. It's a very male-dominated profession. Um, but there, I feel like with experience, you, you get that confidence and you realize that you can lead and manage in your own way. It doesn't need to be based on the way that a male is particularly 
um, that a male would necessarily lead. Um, and I think that when, when you find yourself struggling or you find yourself losing a little bit of control um, in a discussion, because sometimes debates can get quite fierce, um, even amongst colleagues. And I think that for me, what, I've, what I found that's really, really helped me is to always remember and make the conscious decision to always speak politely and professionally and to restrain yourself. Just bear it in mind. Um, this is something that I say to myself continuously throughout the day um, because I deal with a lot of conflict situ situations being in litigation. So my, con my I mean, there's times where the worst things are going through my head but you put on a poker face, you exercise the restraint, and just remember that at the end of the day, you are a professional and you are also representing the firm that you work for. So it's really important to be able to manage that. Um, another thing that I find that's helped me, and I think that this is also linked to being aware of, of your emotional intelligence, is always try and consciously listen to what the other person is telling you, whether it's a colleague, or an opposing attorney or counsel, always try and listen. Because if you interrupt and you immediately leap onto the offensive, all that happens is you just charge the atmosphere. And a big part of, of my job as a litigator is actually to lower the temperature between clients. So it's not gonna help where I'm reacting with fire. Um, and you, Another, another thing that, that I find is, has really helped me is always go back to the facts of your case. Always be confident enough that you've, you, you are aware of the facts. You know what the objective evidence is. And if you see that things are getting a little bit out of hand, always try and go back to the facts because then you eliminate all the emotion out of it and you talk strictly regarding the matter. And I mean, the worst, absolute worst case scenario where you can see that there's just no way you can get yourself be staying in time. Excuse yourself from the discussion on the basis that, you know what, we can agree to disagree. Nobody's taking this any further at this point. And once you've calmed down in a week or a couple of days and you feel that you need to pick it up, by all means, pick it up. But sometimes it's fine, absolutely fine, let it go. Um, and walk away. Uh, but that's basically what I'd like to say, and I hope it answered your question. Um, but please don't eliminate your emotions um, as a lawyer, because we really need emotionally intelligent and aware attorneys. And this is something that Bowman's at least is focusing on. I mean, I recently did a courageous conversations workshop um, that the firm has implemented, and it's basically well, as a starting point, it's geared towards partners to enable them to have difficult conversations um, regarding career progression with, with junior lawyers. And they basically give you the skills and equip you on, on how to have those conversations from an emotional point of view, because people are obviously different and they already act differently. So there is a huge emphasis on this. And, and I think people, people are viewing lawyers more holistically. Um, and I think that that's, that's really the way forward. Thanks, Umoma. Thank you for that. Um, talking about emotionality and, and um, courageous conversations and, you know, trying to get back to that place of peace, even though you're in an adversarial kind of legal, a particularly adversarial legal department. Do you have to do, do you implement anything in terms of self-care to assist with your mental health? Definitely, yeah. Definitely, Adama. This, this I also can't emphasize enough. Like Lidato mentioned as well, you need to have your out. You need to know what re-energizes you because this profession is not easy. It's, it's demanding. Um, quite often, it can be thankless because at the end of the day, you are rendering a service and you are um, selling time. So for me personally, my time out is walks. Um, I'm obviously in Cape Town, so we have some beautiful scenery over here. So me and my family, we do lots of walks and I also do yoga. Um, and I mean, I, I will say that every person that I work with um, in litigation on my floor 
has a thing that they do. Some people it's gym, some people um, it's yoga, some people swim, um, anything, absolutely anything, but have something, have your outlet. Um, and also know what works for you. Sometimes I know during the day, I need 10 minutes away from my desk. I need 10 minutes out of the building. Otherwise I'm just, I'm not gonna make it through the day. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but you need those little coping mechanisms. Even if it's two minutes of closing your door um, and doing a bit of meditation. Also silly enough, but I mean plants. Plants in my office is a big thing. Uh, because we locked in. I mean, obviously our windows don't open and we're stuck in the air guard. So the plants struggle, but we try. Um, so just whatever works for you. But you, you definitely do need an outlet. I don't, I don't see it, how people survive this job without, without having that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a moment. Okay, so our next question comes from Raisha at, uh, sorry, um, our next question comes from Olena Tandu at Bits University. Tando, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, everyone. Uh, my first question is directed to Keshni, and it asks, what is the wage gap like, and how difficult is it to attain advancement opportunities from a general standpoint? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, it's lovely to have you all on board. Um, having recently been named um, Graduate Employer of Choice in the legal sector um, for the fourth year running, I do think that as a firm, Bowman's is doing something right. Um, insofar as the first part of your question being the wage gap, I've been at Bowman since I started serving my articles in 2009. And I've not personally experienced any unfair or unequal wage gap um, in relation to my male counterparts. However, I am cognizant of the fact that my experience may not always be the same as the next female lawyer. What I can speak for Bowman's, um, as with most corporate law firms, our remuneration is commensurate with our performance. Um, so from a financial billing perspective, as well as uh, the equally important softer skills. Um, provided the billable work is allocated in a transparent and equitable manner, which I'll touch on later, um, the calculation and allocation of remuneration is also done in a transparent and equitable manner. So being performance-based, employees have regular performance discussions um, and we involve the talent team in those discussions. Performance scores are vetted and moderated, and employees are made aware of how they scored in respect of each of the relevant factors. So there are no surprises from that perspective. Um, and your final remuneration is then a product of a matrix of factors um, where you've been involved throughout the process. Just to add, um, and I think Lerata did touch on this, where an employee has been on maternity leave, targets are adjusted accordingly. And this is to just make sure that employees are not disadvantaged as a result of pregnancy and maternity leave. The same applies to secondments, which, although are great opportunities, often affect billing. As a junior partner, I can tell you that the salaries of partners are also a product of a partner participation process, where partners are assessed on a variety of criteria and our salaries are allocated accordingly. As can be expected, there is a, albeit justifiable wage gap between senior and junior partners. And I think this is the case with most law firms and in corporates in general. Um, but all partners are privy to the earnings within the partnership. And we recently completed a partner remuneration review process also. The purpose of that process and that review was to just make sure that our remuneration system is aligned with the strategic objectives of the firm and to encourage behaviors that drive the firm in the right direction. Um, and transparency is a very important part of our culture um, and we favor transparency, um, especially insofar as remuneration. 
there was a second part to your question. Um, I cannot speak for law firms generally, but as a younger female lawyer of color, I've been exposed to several advancement opportunities at Bowman's. We favor ongoing learning and development, and these opportunities are available to everyone. Um, obviously, the attraction and retention of talented women is something that continues to challenge the legal profession, um, and we are no different. To that extent, we've got numerous interventions in place to progress this goal of retaining, uh, attracting and retaining female talent. Um, and that includes the Women in Leadership program called Accelerate. Um, I know Lerato has recently completed it, um, and she can add on that if there's time. We work hard to create a stimulating and engaging environment for all our employees. Um, Bowman's also invests time in mentoring and developing our people to help them to reach their full potential um, and to support working parents. Um, we have a comprehensive parental coaching program and this importantly supports biological, adoptive and surrogate mothers. It's aimed at assisting our employees to manage the journey to parenthood in the context of professional lives. Um, and we also have a very favorable parental leave policy um, and we're in the process of rolling out our agile or working from home policy. Like Lerata, I'm a newish partner um, and I'm due to give birth in December. So I'm very excited about all the support structures that are in place. Thanks, Kashni. Um, you mentioned that you have um, performance management plays a part in your um, kind of wage allocation and wage decisions. What are some of the criteria that you kind of look at when you're um, assessing people via performance management? Um, so obviously billing, I mean, being a corporate law firm, billing is very important. So there is a financial aspect, which, which is quite a, quite a big um, factor into our performance. Um, we also consider other important, I refer to as softer skills. And those are things like your business development, your networking, your commitment to the firm, your involvement um, in pro bono initiatives, um, your involvement in knowledge management. So there's definitely a recognition of your involvement um, other than billing within the firm. And, and what we're trying to do is to encourage well-rounded um, lawyers um, who contribute meaningfully to the profession um, and to society as a whole. Thanks. And then what is the kind of attitude or philosophy that the firm has to doing postgraduate qualifications? to assist with your development and does that play a part in wage discussions? Um, I've not, um, I mean, I've not considered it. I just, I, I, board exams were enough for me and I said I'm never going to study again. Um, but I do know that there are many women completing um, their MBAs and, um, and I know the, the firm is very supportive in that regard. Um, in, insofar as postgraduate studies, I think there are discussions that you can have so far as financial support and, and study loans also. Um, and that is something that comes that, that you can incorporate into your individual development plan that you then discuss throughout your performance review process. So it's definitely that option. Yeah. Thanks, Kashni. Okay, our next question is from Raisha at UP. Raisha, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello everyone. My question is for Lorato. I would like to know what obstacles did you face that are unique to a black female attorney and how would you advise those that come after you to handle and overcome these obstacles? Thank you for that question, Raisha. Um, I'm very conscious that my experiences as a woman of color um, at the firm might be very different to the experiences of other women of color at the firm. So I welcome, please, if anyone else has anything to add to this, please do, because um, I think it is an important topic. And I would like for us as a panel to offer a very candid, transparent perspective of people's experiences. Um, my experiences as a black lawyer at Bowman's um, and some of the challenges that I feel are unique to people who look like me, centered largely around internal struggles that I battled with. 
Um, I struggled severely with um, imposter syndrome and just recurring feelings of inadequacy. Um, and over the years, I've, I've been at Bowman's for 10 years. Um, and in addition to that, I've for a number of years felt out of place um, as if, you know, being a black woman um, from a previously disadvantaged environment, I couldn't bring my whole self to work. Um, and I had to mask certain aspects of myself or over exaggerate other aspects of myself in order to fit in. And speaking to a lot of other um, black women lawyers, I found that these two things are experiences that a lot of them had. Um, so I want to focus on these um, and, and just share honestly with you how I overcame them. Um, there's no one size fits all here. I'm pretty certain that if anyone listening to this goes into the working world and suffers, you know, with similar feelings of inadequacy or feeling out of place or looking at, around at a predominantly white male dominated culture, and just feeling like there's no place for you, you have to chart your own path to overcoming those feelings and you have to come up with your own roadmap um, for processing that and finding your own solutions. What worked for me personally was to remain true to myself. And I literally, it sounds stupid, but I had to authorize myself to be a black woman at work. And I had to give myself permission in all of my interactions and in everything that I did at the firm to be my complete package without fear of being judged or without fear of being ostracized or marginalized. Um, and I had to be intentional about being honest about it. And it would be things like sitting around the table with a number of, you know, of my white male um, fellow partners discussing a social with clients coming up and the overwhelming suggestion is to have a golf day. And I'd have to put my hand up and go, I don't play golf. I personally don't know any other black woman <laughs> um, that I interact with at my level who play golf. Um, and scary as it is to vocalize this, I have to say this is a potentially alienating social event. And perhaps we can think of something that's a lot more inclusive of different people. I mean, it sounds like a tiny example, but for me to raise my voice and say that required me to go, this will make me stick out like a sore thumb. This will make me, uh, people will look at me and go, why is she even here? She isn't like the rest of us. And oh, look at her trying to advocate for everybody else. So it was difficult for me, but I would intentionally vocalize my perspective and 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 this was difficult the second thing i did and again this required a lot of introspection i needed to do it for me is i needed to authorize myself to be courageous um there were times when i felt like the predominant culture in certain environments didn't include me and it's quite easy to say actually I won't be coming to the team social on Saturday or actually I won't be taking part in this. Please don't include me. But I had to be courageous enough to go, you know, even if something isn't centered around a skill or an interest that I have, I need to be courageous enough to show up and be present and have my presence felt and appreciate it and add what I can add to the environment. Again, this seems small, but my personality, especially in the beginning, was just to sort of make myself small and hide in the corner so no one can see me. Um, last but not least, I learned very quickly on in my career that the language that everybody understands from my clients to the senior leadership at the firm to my colleagues is technical excellence. Um, when you're good at what you do and you do it very well consistently so, you build up incredible goodwill and a great reputation for yourself. And that reputation, it speaks for you, even when you're not in the room. So on those days when I felt like I don't belong at the firm, 
I would remind myself that I am a technically strong lawyer and people appreciate that. So I would go out of my way to make myself an invaluable member of any committee, any deal team, any transaction, any matter, any office project, so that my value add speaks for me. And I did that long enough that eventually people just liked having me around because I worked super hard. I was super authentic and genuine and I just was myself and people valued the different perspectives that I brought to the table. Um, and once I got into that sweet spot, I think a lot of the internal fears that I had started to melt away because I now feel like I belong at Bowman's and now I feel like I'm a part of the very diverse fabric that makes up my firm. But I'd be lying if I said I always felt this way. And you know, to any woman of color who goes into a space where they feel out of place, I just want to let you know that those feelings are real. Those feelings are valid. And that you deserve to be heard and you deserve to be supported in any shape or form you need that support in order to process and resolve those feelings and authentically come out on the other side, hopefully completely true to yourself um, and feeling like you belong. I welcome any other perspectives because I know this is quite unique and I zoned in on this, but honestly, in the 10 years that I've been at Bowman's, the most crippling experiences that I've had as a black woman have centered around feeling like I'm a black woman <laughs> in a predominantly white male culture. And, and I've struggled with that. And I've struggled to feel like I fit in. And I've struggled to feel like I'm not an imposter. Um, and when I overcame those, honestly, the firm kind of opened up for me. Um, and it, going to work started being a fun adventure and something that I really, really enjoyed. Thank you, Lorato. That was, it was really nice. Um, you know, it's quite interesting because there's been a lot of research about bringing your authentic self to work, really helping you be a happier person and also to help people to perform better in the workplace. So I work at Bits University and I find it very easy to be myself at work because there's lots of young people and it's pretty white and liberal. Those things have some negative connotations, but it's not a law firm. So I really can come to work and be my full self and I find it a lot easier. I don't think I would be able to work in an environment where I couldn't. But tell me about that journey of looking around you and seeing mainly white men and you're a black woman and you want to be your full authentic self, but you feel like you have to adapt to the environment you're in. What was the journey like to overcome that imposter syndrome and, you know, become Lorato and become the person they hired because she's good enough to do the job? Sure. Um, I think the journey was a long one. Um, it's quite hard to capture in seven minutes a 10-year sort of struggle or evolution. But like peeling an onion, I think I took it one day at a time. I think overcoming imposter syndrome is like seeing this ginormous you know, elephant. And, and as the saying goes, I, I insisted that I just take it one bite at a time. Um, and and honestly, it starts with acknowledging how you're feeling. A lot of people hear great advice, like fake it till you make it, right? Um, and it's easy to try and assimilate and just fake it and hope it goes away. But that didn't work for me because I would feel good for two minutes and then those feelings would come back and it, it was recurring and it was crippling sometimes. Um, so the first thing I had to do was acknowledge that I was feeling out of place and I was feeling like an imposter and that was crippling me, you know, and in the beginning, I'd have some fantastic ideas that I want to raise in a meeting, but I'd feel like, who am I to say this? No one's going to listen to what I have to say. This can't possibly be interesting or valuable to anybody and I'd keep quiet. So it started with authorizing myself to take up space authorizing myself to raise my voice and authorizing myself to play a part in any space that I interacted in. And, and for me, that started the journey of overcoming those feelings of inadequacy. Because you just need to do it once. You just need to put your hand up once in a meeting and give a fantastic suggestion. And you watch everyone in the room go, that's really awesome. Where have you been all this time? 
And that just gives you the, cons the confidence to do it again and again and again. And before you know it, you're the loud mouth in the room and people are like, good grief, it was nicer when Lorato didn't have the confidence to open her mouth. Um, and that's who I am now. I'm not afraid anymore. Now I'm working on kind of shutting up because again, not everyone needs to hear my voice in every single meeting. So it's, it's a journey. It's a difficult one, but you take it one day at a time and it all starts with acknowledging what you're going through, authorizing yourself to resolve it, and then being bold enough to meet yourself at the space where you are and to meet yourself in the heart of your struggles and to allow yourself to be you. Um, and I know that women face, you know, greater challenges than that. I know that black women face discrimination and hardships, which are genuinely compared to what I've been through far more serious. Um, but I had to raise this because oftentimes people feel like um, feeling out of place is something small and not being able to be yourself is not so important and they kind of die on the inside and i and i wanted to let people know that the struggle is real and it's okay for you to battle with this and and hopefully come out on the other side thanks larata kashini did you want to add something yeah just to add to what larata said i like i said earlier and when i answered my question i moved to johannesburg in 2009 to complete my articles so I completely relate to the imposter syndrome, um, you know, moving from a traditional Indian family, being very quiet, very um, introverted. I'm still quite introverted. Um, moving to the big, um, big city and, and especially to this big law firm with so many strong personalities and strong, successful personalities. Um, I felt a similar way. Um, and I think that's why, that's when it's so important where you work. Um, because I, I think what helped me to come out of my shell was the people who I surrounded myself with and the strong women, um, especially within the firm. Um, I've been very fortunate um, to be surrounded by a strong woman um, within the department, within the firm as a whole. Um, and I think as difficult as it is as a female um, lawyer, it's important because as you work your way through the ranks, there's people watching you, especially young females in the same position as you. Um, I've had many young black females in my team who I know went through and felt exactly what I was feeling. And for me, it was very important um, to make them feel the way others made me feel, um, which was welcome and and able to express myself um, and able to just put up my hand and, and, and contribute meaningfully to conversations. Um, it does take time. Um, and I think I speak up a lot more now, 10 years later, um, but it is very important, like I just said, to, to own your space in the room um, and to stand up and, and, and be heard. Um, and I think the environment that we're in allows us to do that. Thanks, Kashini. Lerata, did you want to add something else? Um, not to this topic, because I think Kashini very beautifully packaged it and, and sent it off. But just to my initial question, there was a fantastic follow-up question that came up in the chat, which I saw afterwards, and I just wanted to take one minute to close the loop. The question was, the, the parental support that I've received at the firm as a working mom now, um, is this only by virtue of the fact that I'm a senior person in the firm, i.e. a partner, or is this available to everybody? I think it's important for me to close the loop on that and say that our very progressive parental policy is accessible to every woman at the firm. Whether you're in support staff, you're a CA, or a partner or senior management, everyone across the spectrum has access to that support. And I think the firm decided last year to roll this policy out to everybody, whether you've adopted or you're a surrogate mother, like Keshini mentioned, um, so that we have equality across the spectrum. Um, and also we have quite a progressive parental, um, sorry, paternity leave policy that also factors in the dads, because I think it's just as important to add the dads into the conversation regarding family responsibility as it is to cater for the moms. So just had to quickly throw that out there so people don't walk away going, oh, that's fantastic, but it's only available to partners probably, so it doesn't really count. 
Thanks for that clarification, Lerato. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. And this one comes from Charlize at the University of Cape Town. Go ahead, Charlize. Hi guys, my next question goes to Tiani and it reads, what does transformation within the legal sphere look like for women in particular? Thank you. Thanks, Charlize, for this question. Yeah, so I'll answer um, kind of from a tactical perspective and then from, an, I guess, more information perspective. So I would say one thing that I've seen that's really helped women in terms of um, growing the, their careers, especially um, from what I've seen here, is that a lot of women are taking up roles in knowledge management. So the knowledge management officer type of role. And what this role is about is about um, using, creating uh, knowledge bases or, you know, based on the different practice areas that exist in the law firm and creating like just canons of knowledge um, that are, you know, it's, the information is available, it's, it's online, and they basically, you know, use technology to be able to create, um, you know, solutions that can be deployed in the firm to make certain processes faster and easier. You can develop your own legal technology solutions that you can then uh, package and sell to clients uh, or to external, you know, people as well. So it's really about, it just boils down to one of the ways that women can, you know, use, using technology, embracing technology to be able to help you to, um, if you want to stay in practice, but you, maybe you no longer want to practice or decide that you want to grow out your career um, in a way that's not, that's still within a, a, a law firm industry or within the law firm, but not in, uh, in practice, that's something that's a really good um, option. And it's something that's really useful and extremely important now. And I think we've all seen the need for it as we've kind of had to go digital, you know, by force or fire or, you know, because of this pandemic. So you'd want as a woman to start thinking and looking at ways that you can leverage technology tools that will allow you to get parts of your life back by being able to use technology to augment your work. So um, whether it's document management tools, contract drafting tools, um, practice management, whatever it might be, like how are you or can you adopt technology to help make your work better so that you can get back, you know, parts of being able to certain work that certain things don't have to take as long and sometimes there might be that like concern like oh my gosh am i going to lose my billable hours if i you know use um you know like a e-discovery platform tool as opposed to you know me kind of like just like slogging it out um and it's about you know being able to deliver efficiency to your client to the client like what tando said clients the language that they understand is technical excellence. And if they're seeing the value in, you know, you are coming back, you're turning around or work, turning work around faster, it's coming back on time, you know, you're able to help them save on costs by virtue of, you know, implementing some of these technology systems, then that's a win. Why would a client, you know, leave you if you're giving them work at that, at that level? So from just a, a technical, tactical perspective, it's I really encourage um, women to find ways that they can use technology to help you to improve, you know, the quality of the work that you do, because then you, when you look at um, the legislation that exists, you know, in terms of BE to support, you know, women in, in practice or not just in practice in any type of profession and kind of creating those opportunities and so on, you're not only like a good candidate just because you're a woman, but you're a good candidate because you're prepared, you've been doing the work, you're ready to um, thrive, you know, and, and, you know, basically like gallop in terms of your profession. And I would also say um, transformation, not only from a legal perspective, but I also do encourage women in the legal industry to look at starting up their own uh, 
whatever type of, whether it's a, a, a embracing that in entrepreneurship as well. Um, because when I started out our legal consulting firm back in um, 2014, we were able to grow by taking advantage of, um, you know, preferential procurement policies that, you know, exist in some places and being able to grow in that way. So I really think um, women should, sorry, there's like the toddler here. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, taking on entrepreneurship is also something that would be a way that women can um, find more of those opportunities and being able to leverage the opportunities that exist. And I would, I think now having been, being now in a country where you don't have access to things like BE in America, you know, yes, they are like diversity and inclusion initiatives, but it's not at the level that you have it, that we have it in South Africa. So it's a very different environment in that sense. So when you're not able to see the privilege that being, um, you know, having these policies does give you and making, you know, the most of them. And then you tell women like, you know, you need to be very um, upfront and, you know, put your hand up go after those opportunities. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to plug um, my podcast called Make the Shift with the Legal Work. Um, and it's targeted at um, women that are making career changes. So you wanna make a switch pivot or quit uh, to do something else, you know, in the, within, as, as a legal professional. And we've spoken to women from all over the world about all the changes that they've made in their career. So another aspect that's really important in um, transformation is also community. You can't make these big sweeping changes on your own. It is not going to work. So it's also being very intentional about building the community around you that's going to support you and work with you, getting mentors in place, getting sponsors in place. You need all of that um, in order for the transformation changes to actually mean something. It doesn't work in a vacuum. So it's also really important um, it's coming out of this discussion if there's someone that says things that you resonate with for you to be able to connect with people and build up that community so that you can actually make good use of the of the resources that exist thanks thanks tiani um and maybe you could drop the details of your podcast into the chat and then we can share it with the attendees as well and hello to your toddler who's also part of our power our discussion today. Okay, so our next question comes from Laurie at Stellenbosch. Laurie, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi there. Um, so our question is for Umema, and it yeah, it concerns how do you maintain professionalism in a situation where you are being undermined or where there are sexist remarks that are being passed by colleagues, um, your, your male coworkers, or even other clients? How do you handle that situation? And also, is it, is it prevalent? Have you seen it in the workplace? Yeah. Thanks, Louis. Um, so that's, it's obviously, a, it's quite a difficult um, question. I don't have a, a clear cut answer for you in terms of how these types of situations should be dealt with because obviously they vary in extremes. Um, but what, what, I think it's, what I think is really important to note up front is that this is something that obviously impacts a lot of women in the workplace generally. I think that the legal profession, like it's been mentioned, it is still quite traditional. It is still schooled very much by an old boys club. Um, and I think the degree to which you will experience it in a law firm in part depends on which practice area you're in, because obviously there's certain practice areas where there is a lot more women. Um, than there is men. And then obviously you get my practice area, which is very male dominated in terms of, I mean, if I look at the composition of, of our team, I think we have these two female partners and two female senior associates. And um, if I just look at those two levels and then 
obviously the men far exceed us. When you're dealing with an opposing attorney, quite often in litigation, it's going to be a male. Um, the same thing with judges, the same thing with arbitrators. So quite often I do find myself being the only female um, involved in a matter. And I can't speak for everybody. What I can say is for me personally, I haven't experienced it as much within the firm um, and amongst my, my male colleagues. Um, I have experienced discrimination, sexism, undermining from particularly other attorneys, um, opposing attorneys outside of the firm. Um, and it's a joke that we actually have on our floor. We call it mansplaining, um, where it's, you know, an a guy will just, a male will just not listen to you. Um, and all it takes is a call from the male partner and then things are smoothed over. So, I mean, it's insulting, it's demoralizing. I, it's, it's something that I hate, but that being said, um, it's very really difficult to be courageous about it and it's very really difficult to speak up. I think especially as a junior female attorney, um, it's difficult sitting around a boardroom table being the only woman, potentially the only woman of color, uh, the only person who speaks a little bit differently and there's six or seven white males around you. It, like Lerato mentioned, golf. You know, there's a, it's, it doesn't always feel like an in inclusive environment, but something that I wanted to touch on and, and, and what's really helped me is, as women, we always need to remember that there's value in our opinions and we don't need to sit there and endure any form of abuse. And I feel that you should, your workplace should equip you sufficiently to enable you to come forward if anything like that happens and it's sufficiently serious that you feel that you cannot deal with it yourself. Um, there needs to be proper processes in place. Um, there needs to be appropriate grievance procedures. And I think it's very important for organizations to make sure that their women feel that such behavior will not be tolerated. Um, and although I do, I have been a junior female lawyer, I have sat at those meetings, I have had remarks made to me, um, I have heard remarks made about other women, um, other female colleagues, and just practically, I mean, I would walk out of those, those meetings feeling extremely disappointed in myself for not being brave enough at that stage to actually speak up about it. But if I look at myself today, obviously I'm a lot more confident, I have a lot more experience and I don't feel that I need to sit there and be quiet and allow a man or anybody else to speak to me in a way that I feel is inappropriate. Um, and I would just, I mean, my, I would welcome anybody else's uh, thoughts here, but I mean, for me, I personally just try again and exercise a level of restraint. And that being said, you are fully entitled to call out the behavior. I have called out behavior in the past. And I think it's also important as female lawyers is to band together um, in a sense that if a remark is made in a meeting and other female colleagues are sitting there, speak up, don't be a bystander. And the way you choose to do that is up to you. You can say it in a jokey way, like, what, what are you talking about? That's so discriminatory, you know, and try to diffuse the situation. Um, or you, you deal with it directly and you deal with it decisively. I think you need to deal with it right there. And I personally have been in meetings where I've seen senior female partners shut this down. They, and I mean, that's an amazing thing to see. Um, and it also inspires your confidence. It inspires your bravery. And for me personally, I think a turning point for me was I became a mom um, five years ago and I have a daughter. And when I look at her, I, that immediately is a motivation for me. Um, and it's something that I bear in mind that I have a responsibility, not only to my daughter, but to future generations of women to create a workplace where they feel safe and where things like this quite simply do not happen anymore. 
And I think that it, it really comes down to, to confidence. But if you feel that, you know, speaking out might be completely career limiting, I promise you within an organization, there will be somebody that you will be able to go and speak to. You will have relationships escalated, escalated to talent, um, escalated to another partner. Um, and, you know, I just feel that if you do not get the help that you need, then you need to think about the workplace where you find yourself in because it's never okay. Um, and that, that's just some, some, of my, some of my insights. Another thing that I would just add on to is that, that power dynamic, I think, in a room um, as a female lawyer of color, um, specifically in litigation, because I can only speak to that practice. There is a power dynamic in a meeting where, you know, you obviously don't necessarily see another woman sitting there. Um, and you, you do feel a sense of isolation. But like Lerato said, you need to be able to manage that. Um, and something valuable, I mean, I also did maternity coaching and I can't even explain the benefit that that process had for me. Um, but one key thing that I've taken out of that is, as a female, always remember that you have something valuable to add. And by you keeping quiet in a meeting and by you not speaking up, you are depriving everybody of your value add. Um, so always be conscious of that. And you can do whatever you'd like. You could say whatever you'd like, as long as you try and maintain a level of professionalism. Um, so please don't try, it is difficult, but be courageous, speak up. Um, I mean, we, we are all in this together as women, and I think we need to continue to have these conversations to, to eliminate it and also provide support to junior female attorneys. I think that is, is essential because I would never want a female lawyer feeling um, like they cannot speak up because a key client behaved inappropriately because she felt that it was going to limit her career. In, in my mind, that's never okay. And, and the sense I get from the firm is we take this very, very seriously and these things are dealt with um, swiftly. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if anybody else would, would like to add how they actually deal with it. I mean, I know we all deal with lots of men yeah. in this profession. <laughs> I think this is an important topic, so I'm going to hand it over to some other people on the panel. Amanda, did you have something to add? What I've seen emerging in this discussion today that's so beautiful is the importance of the internal work. And I wanted to just speak to that because it's also coming up in a lot of the questions the students are asking about how to prepare themselves. Um, and so on the, on the one hand, there's this aspect that you learn at university, which is the, you know, the technical skills of the job. And Lerato has spoken to how very important that is, that you have those skills. But for me, what was always missing at university, and I, that was now a long time ago that I was there, but um, I'm still seeing it, is this lack of teaching people about themselves. So that, that true empowerment isn't happening. And that's this massive lacuna where women get into practice and they're floundering and going, you know, you're lucky if you're able to get the maternity coaching or just a professional coach if the, course, the firm is running things like courageous conversations. But all too, too often women aren't getting that sort of support. And so what I see has been missing and, and still is, is the internal journey so I would advise students, you need to do things like a values survey, you know, think about your values, what's important to you. Um, it's come up a few times today about learning how to be authentic, but how do you learn how to be authentic when you're not sure who you are, particularly when in your 20s, you're so busy trying to fit in and get the job. It's very hard to be authentic because, yeah, there isn't a sense of who am I being authentic to? Imposter syndrome it comes up all the time with a whole lot of students dealing with sexual harassment, mansplaining, as Umano was talking about, the, those responses. And so the biggest and best way I think that you can prepare yourself for a successful career in law is doing the internal work. And don't think that it's only about your marks. Um, the other things are going to serve you better. So what is it that's holding you back in your life? Where do you self-sabotage? Where do you have, you know, patterns of behavior that aren't serving you? If it's confidence and speaking up in public, you know, how could you, could you join Toastmasters? What are the things that you could do to better equip yourself? Um, 
and then I will say that I have spent quite a long time trying to get universities to do this what I you know I called it leadership um, work because it's a more palatable thing because otherwise you, you know people throw this into soft skills and see it as unimportant um, so I called it leadership work and there was a lot of excitement and yes that sounds great but I have to say that none of the universities actually have have embraced it you know a little a professor here a professor there but there haven't been full-scale initiatives to give lawyers the, the 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 work that they actually need that internal journey of stepping into their power and so that's the work that I still do with women and you can you can find me on Instagram in at women leading law um, I'll put that in the chat um, and I've realized that this wonderful thing that has happened this year during lockdown is that um, South Africa is finally ready for online teaching. And so there isn't, you know, this need anymore that I did have to go and teach through all the universities. Now I'm just like, well, I'll teach it anyway. And the students who are ready, you know, can come. So I'm seeing a lot of people that I'm ready to ask as um, uh, already guests onto some of these, these, these kind of webinars and, and further platforms. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, the interior journey. I just want to stress that. Thanks, Amanda. And please do um, put a link to your um, social networks in the chat. And then Keshni, I believe you wanted to add to this discussion as well. Yeah, so just to pick up from where Amanda left off, um, even as a, as a partner, and having been at the firm for more than 10 years, I still struggle, I think, with that internal journey um, and allowing myself to speak up. I've been in situations as a partner where I was questioned by an advocate as to whether I've ever been in court. Um, have, you know, the, the remark was, if you've ever been in court, you would know this and this and this. Um, and I didn't speak up and I didn't say anything. I mean, obviously, as a partner, I have been in court. Um, but it threw me so much that my natural reaction was just to resort to being that introvert and keeping quiet. And, and those skills um, that Amanda mentioned about being able to speak up and, and developing um, along that internal journey are so important, especially as a, as a female trying to make your mark um, in this industry. Um, I've had an incident with a CCMA commissioner where I appeared with a female team. I had a young female um, advocate with me and I had a junior um, attorney with me um, and I was a partner at the time. And we sat down in the room and the commissioner said, oh, no, these seats are for the legal practitioners. Um, and again, not one of us said anything. We were so taken aback by the assumption that these young women of color could not possibly be the legal representatives. And looking back, I wish I'd said something because I had a junior female, part, a junior female lawyer with me who probably would have benefited from me saying something, um, you know, it would have had to have been in a respectful manner. It was a senior commissioner at the CCMA, but I wish I had said something. Um, and hopefully, you know, we're all on this on this continuous journey and this path of learning. Hopefully, if I was in that situation um, now, a year later, I would be able to deal with it a lot better. Um, but it is a continuous learning curve, and uh, yeah, it's just something I wanted to share that it it happens even to partners. Um, and, it, and it throws you, and then when you look back, you wish you'd help you to handle it better. Thanks, Kashni. I think we've all been there when, when we replay it over in our mind and we go, I should have said this, I should have done that. But don't hold yourself hostage to that stuff because the person who said that has just moved on. Um, but you know, you'll learn and you'll have some very funny comebacks after a while, which can also be very fun. So I'm going to um, hand over to Abigail for our next question. Abigail at UWC, please go ahead. Hi, um, my next question is to Umayma as well. Um, it goes as follows. What can be done to be more inclusive of women in the workplace in order for them to occupy top positions in both the corporate and public sector? Thanks, Abigail. Um, thanks for your question. I think we've we've touched on on a few on a few aspects um, that I think it's really important uh, for workplaces to implement uh, in order to advance women. And I'll just raise uh, a couple of high level high level points for me um, as a as a working mother specifically. I think that there there definitely needs to be a bigger emphasis on work life balance. Um, I think that with COVID 
one of the blessings that's come out of this is that law firms and workplaces generally have been forced uh, to allow their employees to, to work from home um, and have a greater degree of flexibility. And I am really hopeful that we will continue in this way because um, I often feel, I mean, being a working mom at certain points, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I remember when my daughter started uh, play school, she would need to be fetched at 12.30. Um, and she was in Kenilworth, and I obviously work in the CBD. That's a 20-minute 20, 20 commute there. Then it's rushing from work at about half past 11 to get there on time, get her, put her in the car, bring her home, bring her into the house, and then go back to the office. Um, and basically getting back at like half past two, quarter to three. What I will add is that was me putting unnecessary pleasure on myself because had I just spoken up and said, look, guys, I'd like to work from home in the afternoon on the days that I do need to pick up my daughter, that would have been perfectly fine. But again, as women, we have this, I don't think anybody is more critical of us than ourselves, you know? And for me, there was a big, I wouldn't call it shame, but I, it was difficult for me to walk out of the office um, to go and fetch my daughter. And it's difficult to come back in because my perception was that, oh my gosh, everybody's looking at me. I'm the only female on the floor or one of the only two females. Obviously negative, um, people are going to think about this negatively, like I'm prioritizing my child over my work. Um, and all of that was in my head. That's not how it works. And I think that for me, what's really inspiring is when you have fathers uh, who are partners, like in, in my team, that are active parents, completely active. They, there's a male partner that works with me. And when his daughter was younger, I mean, he was out of there uh, to go watch swimming meets. Anything that she was doing, he was gone and everybody knew that's where he was going. And we had a discussion one day and he made me realize there's actually no shame in it. I mean, he was obviously for a man, it's different, you know, they, it's like, oh, look at him. He's being such a good dad going and watching the swim meet with a mother. It's kind of expected. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. Whatever, you know, she's going, she's going to be with her family. That's more important. Um, so I think that we definitely need to have emphasis on that work-life balance, particularly flexibility. And I think that there needs to be, especially for junior lawyers, you need, workplaces need to be able to support you at different times in your life. And that's where I find that Bowman's has really helped me. There's always been, um, I've always had scope to find my own path. And there's a big emphasis on that within the firm is that not everybody's walking the same road. Not everybody's getting to the same point at a certain time. So, Work-life balance is definitely one of that, one of, one of the um, aspects we need to look at more. Um, I mean, I haven't been a victim to this, but I do know that in corporates, there is a gender pay gap that exists. And I think that there needs to be a lot more openness and transparency about that um, in the workplace. Uh, but I don't see why women should ever get paid less than a man for doing his own job, for doing the same job. And I think that with flexibility, a man may be able to work from nine to five and possibly a woman, because she's a mom or has a different interest or has something else to do, you might not necessarily clock nine to five, but you could clock nine to 12. And often like I do, I will log on in the evening once my daughter's sleeping and I'll work a bit. So you, your organization needs to have that um, flexibility. I also think that there needs to be specific workplace initiatives that, that support women. Um, so maternity coaching would be one uh, that I think is invaluable. And that's coaching before you go on maternity leave. And it's coaching when you come back as well. Um, I think that that support for, for working mothers is absolutely invaluable. I also think that meaningful mentorship programs um, need to be accessible to junior lawyers. Um, and I also think that there needs to be an, a, a consciousness about diversity and unconscious bias 
um, at senior levels within the firm. I think that that's very important. I mean, when I'm, I'm a very newly promoted partner, um, and one thing that, that stuck out to me is when I got promoted, one of our CAs came to me, and she, she's also a person of color, and she said, I, I just feel so inspired and I feel so hopeful because now there's somebody that looks like me and there's somebody that speaks like me and I feel like I, I, could, I could get there and I can chart my own path within the firm. And that was something that really resonated with me because I never thought about it like that before. Um, I've been walking, walking this path and um, I never thought that, I never realized how important it is for other women to see similar um, females. Um, in terms of race, uh, anything, family life, hobbies, careers, but that gives, uh, I mean, that, that helps women see that they can get there um, and the ease scope to do it in your way. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is networking initiatives. And this is something that I think law firms particularly struggle with. Um, in networking initiatives, we obviously have a lot of it, well, we did before COVID. Um, and that's really where people get exposure to clients. That's where you can potentially build relationships. And it's really just about showing up and making yourself visible and building your brand. Um, and networking events obviously is held after hours. So this for me has always been a barrier to women. It's, I, I don't think it's a conscious barrier, but I do think that if you're having an event at six or seven o'clock, it's a bit difficult to expect a working mom um, to join in on those events. So I think that there needs to be consciousness at a management level about that. Um, we, I'm not saying, you know, we should get special treatment and there can never be a networking event at six or seven, but be conscious of it so that not all of them are scheduled for that time, possibly have some during the day. Um, and I mean, golf is something we always go back to, but don't, don't do a golf day. Just, just don't do it um, if there are female lawyers involved. Um, so yeah, I think that those, those are key areas that we, we do need to, to focus on. Thanks, Umayma. I think we're getting a very loud message about golf in the legal industry. <laughs> I think it means you should take it up now as students or if you I should think start female, hashtag Female attorneys are just ban golf. <laughs> hashtag ban golf. Um, Tiani, um, you wanted to add something. I wanted to add that if the work of women in the legal industry or whether it's in the public space or in, in private sector, taking up those leadership roles, like kind of echoing what everyone else has been saying is first of all, wanting it. You have to want to be um, in, the, in those leadership circles and spaces and also believing that you belong there and that whatever it is that you are trying to create is important and useful. When we were starting out logistics in 2014, no one was really, I can only think of maybe two or three other companies that were private companies offering legal services to the public. So at that time, if you needed legal services, you had to, I mean, what was normal was that you go to a law firm. You didn't go to a private company that was offering um, legal services and we had to, you know, kind of um, forge our own way and, you know, get authorization and talk to, well, get confirmation from the law society and be like, hey, can we do this? Is this, is this allowed? And they were basically like, uh, well, it's not allowed, but it's also not not allowed. So we're like, okay, we'll just operate in this, you know, in this um, kind of interesting space. And then even when the Legal Practice Act like now came out, like it doesn't really say that you can't, but I mean, it, 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 there's still room for, you know, for it to get to kind of create more clarity around that. So it was, you know, difficult. We had to educate our clients about that. You know, it's, it's safe to use us. We're still attorneys. We still, you know, have um, are, are liable basically to the law society if anything goes wrong. Um, but it was us just having that belief that there has to be another way to practice law outside of you being in the law firm or being um, in-house in a company or, you know, working for the state that there has to be like kind of this, uh, I like to call it like the, the an alternative or like the third way. And so if there is 
you know, someone who's here who doesn't really see themselves kind of fitting into the existing options and you have a different idea, like create that thing, like do that thing. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be, you know, extremely difficult, but you, you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the people that you can reach and help to try that. And growing that now, it's been finding it's it's now you know taken up it's 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 um it's found its pace it's found its rhythm and to, and it's now become really common like now people come to us and like ask how can we you know create our own legal consulting firm and it's now you know common practice to have them now in 20, 2020 whereas in 2014 that wasn't you know uh, a common thing for someone to want to do so i really um recommend that you know trying this trying something uh different and again, just believing that what you're doing is necessary and also wanting to be the best, wanting to play at the, you know, the largest stages. And I absolutely love having have had, you know, some type of success in, in South Africa and then moving here to the U.S. and being completely humbled, having to start from the beginning, like wherever, where it doesn't matter, like any of the things that you've done. But again, you know, having built up, done that work that everyone has been speaking about, uh, developing that that confidence to be able to come into a new space and you know not to be afraid of you know taking on the challenges and it's not easy because I mean obviously this is not home there's no network and th th that the support systems that exist but it's really just now about just like grit resilience and just being co committed to doing the work whatever that might be so I it would really be uh, women wanting to be in those leadership positions women you know um, rolling up your sleeves and just getting ready to to do that work so that would just be my 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 last comment um on that thanks tiani um so our next question comes from alana tanda at vets please go ahead um my next question is di um directed to Keshni and it asks do you feel that the, the judiciary is taking gender-based violence seriously enough? And also, what can we do to improve this, particularly considering the need to overcome the systematic disadvantages that are faced by women pursuing gender-based violence claims in courts? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, the short answer is no. Um, we've all heard of cases where victims, or let me rather say survivors, of GBV are not taken seriously and or are shamed in court. But I think we need to remember that the judiciary, judiciary is just one part of the problem. Before our cases of GBV even get to court, we need to consider the role of our police officers, for example. Um, and a major part of the problem is the fact that our police officers are ill-equipped to deal with these cases with the urgency and sensitivity that's required. Um, I think we all know that survivors are shamed and blamed um, and not taken seriously enough. And where evidence is collected, um, it's not handled with the necessary care. Um, and this lack of empathy and sensitivity leads to many cases not even getting to court due to the secondary assault suffered at the hands of police officers. Um, in addition to that, where women are able to obtain protection orders, police officers um, are not uh, known to readily enforce those, those protection orders. Um, so yes, the judiciary, we, we, I do admit the ju that the judiciary is not handling it um, and not doing enough, but I think that the problem starts a lot earlier on in the process. Um, and as to what we can do to improve this, I mean, we don't have the whole day, but I think <laughs> that at a grassroots level, awareness, education, um, and training is the best starting point, starting with police officers and, and station commanders. Um, survivors of, of GBV need to be made to feel like they have a safe space to turn to. And at the moment, um, many women feel like they don't. Um, and women need assurance that they will be taken seriously um, when they do choose to report um, these cases of GBV. Um, and I think that that will help with the reporting of cases before the cases even get to the judiciary. I think a lot of cases don't even get to, to the judiciary because women are so scared. Once being assaulted, you know, again, 
um, by the police officers, and I use the word assaulted, because it is an assault. It's an assault on your character. Um, you know, women are questioned as to where they were, what they were doing, what they were wearing. Um, and that's, for me, is a bigger part of the problem before we can point fingers at the judiciary. Yeah, so I, I'm going to keep that answer very short because I see that we're, we're running out of time. And if there's any Thanks, Kashni. Yeah. Thanks, Kashni. I think it was an important question to address. Yeah. We've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to let the last question be asked. Um, it's um, from Raisha at UKZN. Please go ahead and ask your question. Um, my next question is to Amanda. I would like to know if there was ever an instance where you would have to compromise your femininity in any way in order to be seen as an equal to your male counterparts. So in terms of my own journey, never mind compromising my femininity, I feel like I had to compromise my entire personality. Um, and I've often joked about how I initially ran screaming from the law. Um, and I actually, I, I left and it was very hard to leave because having finally, you know, been told you're an attorney, it was quite hard to um, decide that I was going to exit at that point. Um, but I found myself running a college for students from townships out along the garden route. And what was extraordinary there is that I suddenly found I could be myself. And that was so empowering and like I had value instead of sort of constantly comparing myself to others and feeling like I wasn't enough. So um, I think that firms have changed. And what is difficult to kind of comment on is how much of the work was work that I needed to do. And that's why I always stress this point about the internal journey, because I feel like in that environment, I wasn't really able to be myself. And I definitely would put some of that blame um, at law firm culture, this sort of rigid, you know, conservative environment, et cetera. You know, um, I think at the same firm, somebody told me that some years before, um, she just made partner and they were having this cocktail part, part, uh, party at the firm. And one of the old partners or ex-partners who was now sort of in his 70s came over and said, and who do you type for? Um, and then, you know, that, that was in his mind what women were doing at the firm. So, look, things have changed, but not quite fast enough. So some of the things I would say I would lay at, at law firm culture's door in terms of people not being able to to just kind of be who they are, that there's this idea you need to look like this, wear things like this, you need to make your points in a certain way, you know, take yourself terribly seriously. Um, but the other part of that is that I was in my 20s and so I wasn't really ready to embrace all of who I was or just to be okay doing that. Um, and that's been a long journey. So where I am now is, is very, very different. And then I feel like I have to comment on the word femininity because when I, I thought about it, much like the word feminism, you know, the word itself is a little bit problematic. And I thought, why? Like, why don't I sort of like the word femininity? What is it? And it sort of makes me think of something pink and frilly and, I don't know, feminine hygiene products. And then I realized that it's, you know, what I've been fed and programmed by society and what I've been shown, you know, things like be more feminine. Um, and what, what is being said there is not the characteristics that I ascribe to as the characteristics of powerful women. So even the term femininity for me is like a little bit problematic. And what I see as embracing your strong female, you know, skills and tools and side is, is this ability to have extraordinary emotional capacity to use your intuition um, women are amazing at connecting and seeing the value in relationships. So we are actually wired. Um, the, the, the neuroscience shows that women are wired differently to men and that we have more synapses when it comes to the relationship centers and to the emotional centers. Um, and so in law firms, for example, women are seen now that more research is being done, that they add value sometimes in different way, like less obvious ways. So women keep clients. Men may be better at work at bringing in new work, but women keep clients. Women are amazing when it comes to teamwork, building strong teams. So there are all sorts of other ways, not just the bringing in new clients that, that are seen as important. And I think too often women still 
are trying to adopt a quite male persona, which they see as, as that is what I need in order to succeed. And so there, there I think um, you also have spoken to that occasionally, this lack of role models. How do you know who, um, who to emulate when there's so few strong women role models, you know, ahead of you that you can learn from? Like what does being a woman using her intuition in a meeting, what does that look like? What is a woman showing extraordinary compassion and empathy in managing the client? You know, what does that, that look like? So I do think it's sad that, I have been told a lot over the years that there are young women lawyers who are incredibly aggressive. And I think one is the behavior being labeled as aggressive because they're women. And would that behavior be lab labeled aggressive if, if it were men? And two, are they doing that because they perceive that that's what is necessary in order to be noticed and to get ahead? Are they trying to sort of out male the, the men? And then again, there's that thing of in your 20s, you may sort of adopt personas and you, you kind of play roles. That's what we all do to try and fit in. In your 30s, hopefully that lessens as you start figuring and getting a clearer sense of your own identity and who you are. And then by your 40s, hopefully you are then really integrating and no longer wearing a, a mask when you go to work and having a work persona and a home persona. Absolutely, professionalism is still there. And, you know, you may adopt a certain tone with your clients in order to, or when speaking in court. And that's not what I'm talking about. But when you find that you're essentially quite a different person at work and at home, that's when you start finding that there's all sorts of high stress on the individual. Um, that can lead to all sorts of things, substance abuse, etc. Just that wearing a mask all the time becomes quite exhausting. It fragments the psyche. So yeah, that's a, that's a quite long answer. I feel like I have had to compromise my femininity, but I think women need to start exploring what are the strong female characteristics that you want to embody and where can you find people that you can aspire to whose leadership, yeah, you want to emulate. Um, and unless we have those role models, you're in a little bit of a vacuum. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for that. Um, we are coming to the end of our time allocated today. Um, I think I've got, I see that Laurie has something that she wants to say before I close off. Go ahead, Laurie. Hi, uh, yeah, just briefly, I would just like to say, um, and I've actually, I spoke to Amanda about it a couple of years ago, attending one of her conferences. Um, and just specifically with regards to the women of the next generation and the next generation of women, I think we all, as this generation of women, would like to say thank you to all of the women who have come before us, who have blazed the trail, who have yeah, just really empowered other women in the workforce, who have done the work that they do, and who have really just become such role models for the next generation of women. And I mean, we are so fortunate as students now to have all of you incredible women to look up to and yeah, just to have role models to aspire to. And I know that that is something that many of you did not have when you were growing up. And I think, yeah, I think we do just want to say thank you for that. Thanks for that, Laurie. Really appreciate it. Um, with that, I am going to close the panel. I want to say thank you to all the students and all our panelists from industry that took part. I think we all learned something. Um, we had quite a, a good chat that kind of went deep and um, went into some of the good things, some of the support you can see when you get into the legal industry. And I want to thank, thank the panelists for being really frank about some of the moments that kind of had me going, oh my God, this still happens. But you know what? It's better to just be honest about it and talk about it, you know, fully and get it out there. Um, I really look forward to your generation getting into the workplace because some of these guys, they, they still need to see it. And, you know, we're getting tired. So I'm looking forward to you coming into the workplace and kind of showing them what's up. Um, but we have a way to go. And I'm really impressed by all the students I see every day at VIPS. So I'm really, I'm really happy and I'm looking forward to the future. I need to say a few other thank yous. I just want to say thank you to Courtney Cantor at the University of KZN, and Tyler Joseph at the University of Western Cape, and Tara Mindendorf at Stellenbosch University. I'd also like to thank the team at Bowman's who helped us put this together, um, Booty, who was our IT assistant, and Kashir from the graduate team. We really appreciate it. Um, this is a really important discussion, and I look forward to many more. 
Unfortunately, some of the questions that were put to us in our chat, we weren't able to answer, but hopefully we kind of touched on your subject. Um, if your question wasn't answered, I suggest that you go back to your student representatives at your universities and perhaps you can look for, um, you can put on some more panels locally where you can address these issues with other women in your community. Um, I think cross-generational talks like this are always of use throughout the year, not just in Women's Month. So with that, I'd like to say thank you so much again for taking the time to um, join this panel discussion. And I'm wishing you the best for the rest of Women's Month and lockdown. Good luck for the exams. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.